So we're going to start with MuleSoft. Ada, welcome, and I'll let you introduce yourself. Good morning, Ala. Good morning, everybody. So happy to see so many people. May 11th floor. OK, hope we get uh, voice working as well. So my name is Ada. I work with MuleSoft. I'm an architect for partners all across EMEA, working with the biggest partners and also driving some of the industry solutions, which is a great, great position to see what's really happening. So we do lots of things. How many of you actually know what MuleSoft does? A few. So in short, uh, our parents think we do uh, backend integration. Our friends think we do APIs. Scott thinks we are the leader in hybrid integration. We think we enable business chains. So, and we do lots of stuff, lots of exciting stuff. And I'm trying to give you a brief overview of what exciting stuff and what our, our customers are actually doing and solving the challenges today. So the challenges with, uh, with business are just accelerated chains in IT and propagating to, to the business side as well. And the factors are the specialization, even go to hyper-specialization, uh, new technology, and the connectivity as well. So this is a formula that I just invented myself. So first, uh, specialization. I'll be touching those three topics and kind of drawing a conclusion how our best customers are trying to solve those, those challenges. So specialization. Any idea what that picture is of? It's a rubber tree plantation in Brazil. So 100 years ago, run by Ford Motor Company. So that was the length and extent that the car manufacturing went 100 years ago with the integrated supply chain. They planted rubber trees to manufacture the rubber, to manufacture the tires to put in their cars. And if you think how cars are manufactured today, it's come a long way. So actually car manufacturers today, their value is uh, building the brand, doing the design, and assembling the pieces. And the pieces come from the ecosystem of other companies. They don't do any of that today. So this kind of uh, specialization and going for hyper-specialization has been happening a lot in IT as well. So this is uh, just, a, just a picture of uh, SaaS applications and applications for marketing industry. So I think thousands of them. So if you take all the industries, there's tens of thousands of SaaS applications today, actually. This is where the IT landscape has been going. So if you want for any specific task and application, there's hundreds of possible SaaS applications you can pick it from. That's the external IT landscape. Then taking a look on the internal landscape, uh, the, you're not supposed to see anything, actually, it's just a picture. That's a Netflix microservices architecture. So also inside the IT architecture, the trend has been to decompose everything in a small independent pieces, specialized components of functionality, and then combining and orchestrating them in the actual product that you want to offer. So that's uh, the hyper-specialization. Then the new technology, so what we are talking is the famous or infamous fourth industrial revolution. So there's lots of people making entire careers talking about this. I'm not going to spend too much time there. I'm sure lots of you have heard about it. Essentially, it's about mobile devices connecting almost all the people on the planet to almost unlimited uh, computing and storage capacity through the cloud. And then you have this, all this new convergence of uh, new technologies, AI, robotics, 3D printing, uh, nanotechnology, biotech, etc. And it's not only uh, these uh, new technologies coming together, but the convergence of those. So combining all of those. Any CIOs in the house? Does it feel... Uh, this is what uh, basically every CIO is betting their nights on. So the delivery capacity today is, uh, is uh, just uh, stable. Or actually there's a standard, there's a joke that it's... Uh, 10% or 20% cost savings every year. So it's kind of going down, actually, your, your IT capacity. And meantime, you need to adopt all these new technologies. And we, are, we have just started. So seeing this convergence of this uh, so-called fourth industrial revolution, there's more and more stuff coming all the time. There's lots of innovation and accelerated change coming. And uh, there's the competition as well. So it can be seen as an opportunity or threat. So... There is a massive delivery gap 
if you continue just on the, on the norm, old way of doing things. Actually, it's a big story of itself, like I could talk one hour about how we propose to do the new IT operating model, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Hopefully, after the presentation, you get so excited that everybody wants to run, run out to our booth. So we have a booth downstairs, so you can come talk about more, more concrete things later. The third factor, hyperconnectivity. So essentially, what hyperconnectivity is, through mobile especially, all the people being able to talk to each other and connect mostly through networks and cloud uh, to any computing resource as well. And through IoT, all the machines are talking together as well. It's your toaster getting bored and uh, talking with the fridge while you're working. Well, hopefully something more intelligent as well. How all this uh, is driven is through APIs. And that's why everybody's spending the day today here. So programmable web, which is, uh, which is thought to be the biggest public catalog of APIs today. So it just hit over 17,000 publicly accessible web APIs. And as you see the curve, it started like uh, five years ago, growing, and there's no sign of slowing down. So probably it's going up. But uh, what I would say is more interesting is this fact. So the public APIs, even the 17,000 sounds uh, staggering, it's just a small tip of the iceberg. And most of the things, and as we are vendor and working with big customers, we, we happen to see this, most of the things actually are beneath the surface, the internal APIs, especially with big companies. So lots of things talk about the external APIs, but even more things are happening beneath the surface. So I'll give you a couple of customer, customer numbers. The mythical bank is world's largest international bank. Unfortunately, it's not yet a public reference, so there's the unicorn logo only. Hopefully, after half a year, it's going to be the real logo. It's not Lloyd's, even there's a horse. So I want you to stop and think about these numbers for a moment. Um, all in all, actually, they got 20,000 APIs. So there's the long tail of older, and there's always going to be some open source uh, uh, code-based bottom-up uh, service development. But on pl our platform especially, there's currently 6,000 managed APIs. There's 50,000 API developers under trading for our platform only. And uh, when they started uh, using that, they started hitting 15 API deployments per second. That's not request per second for API, that's 15 API deployments per second. So stop for a moment and think if you had this at your fingertips. 50,000 API developers, tens of thousands of APIs actually inside your organization. What does it mean? And of course, implication, what are they trying to achieve? So that's the volume of the API development happening in big companies today. Uh, another customer reference, actually, they are, they are public one. So Atom Bank, a uh, very innovative new challenger bank in the UK, mobile only started very simple, uh, so you can interact. They don't have a, even a website, just a website that says go and download your mobile app, no branches, uh, offering account services, and they just introduce mortgages as well. So uh, with an API platform, they were able to do chains for an API and deploy it back to production in two minutes. It used to be 90 minutes before. And with having an API platform, they were able to actually half the number of APIs from 80 to 40. So actually having a platform also simplifies things. It doesn't mean only proliferation of the APIs, but true reuse, for instance. Uh, you can simplify your API architecture. Uh, one day, API full design, development, testing, uh, staging, going to production, life cycle. How does it sound like? It used to be one month. So actually, in a day, if you need an API, you can come up with the concept, do the development, test it, uh, QA, go to production, actually. And there's a new API and capability on your mobile banking app. Complex chains is so involving lots of APIs. And for instance, this introducing mortgages. Totally new service for the business. So they can do this kind of complex changes in two weeks for the whole business. So this is the speed as well. 
that uh, that companies are starting to look for. Of course, Atom Bank, they're a challenger bank, so their whole ideology is, uh, is very different and extreme in many things. But these are the things that actually people are doing. And uh, if you compare to traditional banks, they don't have any of the old legacy, which usually, usually slows, slows down things. But these are remarkable things, I think. And these are exciting things as well. So it's not only the startups of the world that they're doing stuff. It's also the very conventional, huge companies that are picking up and are already up to speed and volume. How they are doing it? Uh, this is a kind of core of our story. I'll just touch very fast on this. So uh, we advocate this API-led connectivity. So you should think about APIs in three different categories. This promotes uh, different speeds of API, uh, uh, IT, uh, different uh, responsibilities for the development and DevOps roles as well. And, um, and reusability. So experience APIs uh, offer whatever resources, functionalities for that channel, for that use case. Process APIs run the systems, provide business data, etc. System APIs connect to your backend systems. So these three categories. I don't uh, like to talk about layered architecture, so it's not really a three-layered architecture, it's three categories of, of APIs, and it doesn't matter where you, where you deploy those. Then going for the business side. So I promised to say a word about value chains. So Porter, the father of value chains, would, uh, would get uh, scared about this picture, but they were very, very much oversimplified. And as you can see, I mapped it to these uh, three categories of APIs in the background, actually. So traditionally, what company does, it owns some kind of assets, produces some kind of products, it has some kind of products that it offers services on or runs its processes on and engages with their customers to sell those through digital channels, traditionally also, also with physical channels. So that's, that's your business. Of course, all, during all the ages, there's gonna be, there, there has been partnerships, like uh, auto manufacturing, the actual producing the products that make up the car come from partner ecosystem. Similarly, for channels, there's always been B2B channels for, for everybody, etc. But what we are seeing are fundamental changes to things. So first of all, this very successful, highly successful and very rapid innovation platform companies. So the standard examples, Airbnb and Uber, the extreme of, uh, of platform companies. They don't own any of the assets, any of the products that they offer. They started with a very highly engaging uh, user ex experience, run a very optimized process on it. That's how they started, although they are embracing other channels nowadays as well. So for instance, your British Airways mobile app, you can order Uber as well when you, when you arrive at the airport, etc. Or then Amazon, Alibaba from commerce side. And actually, from, for Amazon nowadays, it's, uh, it's uh, over 30% of their revenue comes from the partner merchants, not from Amazon selling their own, own stock mer mer merchandise. And applying this one, more and more, the business model gets to be fragmented. And not just kind of uh, because it gets fragmented, but because businesses want to do it. So both internally, and actually the business that runs on top of it, uh, first, take a look at the kind of the perimeter. So there's been lots of startups, and uh, for almost, I dare to say that for all of those, the power of connectivity and, and uh, APIs has been the, has made the possibility for the business. So, for instance, for the engagement, any tra travel travel booking system, any price comparison site or or other, it's just the engagement channel for consumers to consume other other providers, services, and, and actual products. Or the Swedish uh, startup Tink, okay, they do some services as well, but it's mostly a very engaging, the best possible engagement uh, method for your banking. Or then most of the fintechs, for instance, uh, all the payment services, it's a service in the background. So there's usually another engagement method, and they use banks' infrastructure for that one or Ubisoft is uh, AI-powered chatbot service, or these kind of things. So innovation happens around. And uh, what companies in the middle are doing, so to enable this, to foster innovation, both internally, uh, they go for this distributed architecture, so that you can kind of have internal startups uh, starting to develop independently, 
and a faster speed, some new things, maybe just new components or maybe even new business area. Or if you want to be able to adopt from kind of uh, adopt innovation, don't invent, invent yourself. So actually big banks are going for this one. So instead of seeing all these fintechs as competing companies, they, are, they have been building quietly for some time all this capability that actually big bank could offer, for instance, transferwise for international payments instead of using the bank's own international payment services. So that's been happening already for a couple of years behind the scenes. And uh, what essentially is happening and uh, when these companies and this thinking matures, that's what we talk at Microsoft call it uh, application network. So essentially, it's, uh, those are recomposable units of functionality. So you see lots of SaaS applications in there. It's, it's about taking pieces of functionality and exposing all of them as APIs. So it said, for instance, the rise and power of Amazon is uh, coming only fro from that one. So there's a famous Jeff Bezos rant uh, quite a long time ago already that uh, he sent a company-wide email that uh, whenever there's uh, development happening at Amazon, it must be exposed as APIs and shared across organizations. Otherwise, you will be fired. And that's what they did. And that's been giving them the platform, the fast innovation configurable platform. And this is where these uh, companies looking for this adopting this platform mindset, building kind of application network, uh, network with, uh, with uh, reusable functionalities and reconfigurable. If you want to change your SaaS applications, it's so much easier through this kind of connectivity fabric. So powered by API platform, uh, of course, doesn't have to be. I know I'm, I'm Finnish myself, so Nordic countries are very open source driven. So you could write all of it yourself. But the power of platform there is that you get out of the box security governance, policy management, visibility, single tooling for the actual development and all the DevOps processes and everything. And uh, even though in the previous pictures I had a one blue box for connectivity, so in no, no means I meant that it's a big blob, blob living somewhere, that is the connectivity. But what you need really for this future architecture is a distributed connectivity fabric so that you can deploy these APIs. Your pieces functionally can live anywhere and you deploy these uh, APIs as well, distributed. Because when you adopt this platform mindset, what you can build on top of this is what matters. So coming back for this business value chain thing, uh, re, uh, decompose all the monolithic things, all your processes as well. So you get agile, you get the speed for the business as well. And you can adopt innovation from the ecosystem as well. And I got one minute remaining. Oh, it's one, minus one, should have stopped already one, one minute ago. So you get speed, flexibility, and control of the business chains, which is the biggest challenge today. And if you want to learn more, we have the booth downstairs, and uh, we have a summit actually in Oslo in a in few weeks also, if, uh, if you're around, around here. And by the way, tomorrow is Ada Lovelace Day. Thanks. <laughs>